Hello, I'm Li Zhaoping. My group works in the University of Tübingen and Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics. Let me introduce to you what we do our research on. Curious about the brain, we start by exploring the sensory system, particularly vision and olfaction. We use a multidisciplinary approach combining computational ideas, behavioral experiments, and investigations on the underlying neurons and brain circuits. Our team members have diverse and overlapping backgrounds covering these disciplines, and we also learn from our expert collaborators. With this plan, let's focus on vision. In vision, the primary visual cortex, called V1, is the first cortical area to receive retinal inputs. Several decades ago, Hubel and Weasel discovered that V1 neurons are excited by image elements such as short lines and edges. One could use similar approaches to study higher visual cortical areas along the visual pathway, such as V2, V3, V4, etc., and explore how images of more complex objects, such as faces, houses, trees, could excite those neurons. However, decades later, we have not gained as much insight as perhaps expected by Hugo and Weasel. I would like to push the frontier of research beyond V1 by asking new questions. It turns out that, to do that, we need to first understand V1 beyond what is suggested by Hubel and Weasel's discovery. I proposed that vision has three stages, encoding, selection, and decoding. Only a very small fraction of visual input information is selected into the attentional bottleneck and then be recognized or decoded. Critically, in this proposal, this selection starts at V1's output to downstream areas. Therefore, retinal inputs are sent to V1 after some encoding. Then, I have proposed that a saliency map is constructed in V1 from these visual inputs so that each visual field location has a saliency value. For example, this location has the highest saliency value in the visual field, and then this location has the second highest saliency value, etc. I formulated the computational logic that defines saliency and how V1's neural circuit calculates saliency. At each visual location, for example this one, its saliency value is signaled by the highest V1 neural response to this location among all V1 neurons responding to this location. These saliency values are read out by the superior colliculus that receives visual inputs monosynaptically to execute gaze shifts so that the higher the saliency, the more likely it is for this location to be selected exogenously by attention. For example, in this image, this location for this red flower has the highest saliency value in the visual field. It is therefore most likely to be automatically attracting a gaze shift so that the gaze shifts from its initial position here to this location to place this location at the center of the visual field. Now the bottleneck starts so that only a tiny amount of information flows further downstream, yeah, both from the central visual field and the peripheral visual field. The downstream visual areas, visual cortical areas V2, V3, V4, etc., and the next stage of visual processing have to be understood in light of this bottleneck. Now, visual decoding or recognition has to rely on the impoverished information due to this bottleneck. So in the central visual field, if this information is not enough for recognition, for example, is this a red flower or a red apple, and then top-down feedback can go back to V1 to query for more information using the brain's internal model of the visual world regarding what a flower or an apple should look like. And this endows 
the central visual field with visual understanding. However, in the peripheral visual field in these locations, I have proposed recently that this feedback is absent or weaker. So this makes the peripheral vision more vulnerable to seeing visual illusions due to ambiguous or misleading signals from V1. For a timeline, I started working on the encoding stage in the early 1990s and proposed V1 saliency hypothesis, VISH, in the late 1990s. Recently, I developed the consequences of VISH on the, de on the decoding stage in a new framework for understanding vision. Here are two of the strongest experimental supports for VISH. One is that human gaze can be attracted by something that does not appear distinctive at all. If you show this image to the left eye and this image to the right eye, we should perceive a superposition of these two images. This X, uniquely from the right eye, appears identical to all the other Xs because visual cortical areas beyond V1 have only binocular neurons. These areas are blind to which eye receives which input. However, V1 has monocular neurons it can tell that this X is uniquely to the right eye and its saliency mechanisms are geared towards awarding higher responses to locations having unique visual input features. So this location is awarded a higher saliency value by its unique right eye as the origin of visual input. This higher saliency value makes it attract gaze even when observers are doing a task to quickly search for a unique letter O. So therefore, this gaze attraction is bottom up and automatic. Here is another piece of evidence from monkey electrophysiology. If you show this image to a monkey who is doing a task to look for and suck hard to a uniquely oriented bar as quickly as possible, in this case, the bar is here. It could be there, unpredictable where it is to this monkey. And let's say that in some of the trials, randomly mixed with other trials, this target bar is in the residual field of a neuron whose responses are being recorded. The monkey's gaze starts at the central fixation point before the bars appear. And it takes usually at least 200 milliseconds for the monkey to find the target and succumb to it. And when the same input image is shown across multiple trials, again mixed with other trials, the neural responses can be higher in some trials and lower in some other trials, just due to the fluctuations in neural responses. And here we plot the neural responses against the time, starting from the time when the bars appear. And you can see it takes usually 40 to 50 milliseconds before the V1 neural responses rises to the peak. And you can see that among trials, when this rising to the peak can rise higher, these trials are in which the monkey can succumb to the target faster compared to those trials when it takes uh, the neural responses is lower. Yeah? And therefore, these initial V1 responses to an image are indeed the saliency signals to attract this monkey's gaze to the corresponding residual field locations. If exogenous attentional selection is by a saliency map created in V1, it then makes sense that the attentional bottleneck should start at V1's output to downstream visual areas. Now let's investigate the consequent visual processes. I proposed a central peripheral dichotomy so that for looking and seeing in vision, Peripheral vision is mainly for looking, while central vision is mainly for seeing. For example, saliency acts in the peripheral visual field to attract gaze shift to decide where to look. Central vision is more involved once the bottleneck starts. The selected location is placed into the central visual field to be seen. In addition, central vision can use both the feedforward and feedback processes for seeing, whereas peripheral vision is not good at seeing 
since it relies mainly or only on the feedforward processes for C. Therefore, peripheral vision is more vulnerable to seeing visual illusions since it does not have top-down feedback to veto misleading V1 signals. Here is an example of such an illusion. The flashing dots only appear away from where you direct your gaze. Here is another example. The static image appears to have rotating snakes, but only outside your central visual field. Thanks to our knowledge about V1, we can predict new illusions to test our theory. For example, we can build such a random dot stereogram with corresponding dots show to the left and right eyes. And with this binocular disparity, in fact, it depicts a 3D scene with a central disk in front of a surrounding ring. However, if in the central disk, a black dot in one eye corresponds to a white dot in the other eye, this is called a contrast reversed or anti-correlated random dot stereogram. To such a nonsense stereogram, it is well known that V1 neurons respond as if the depth is reversed, so that even though the binocular disparities of these dots are still for a central disk in front of the ring, the V1 neurons respond as if the disk is behind the ring. In other words, the V1 neurons report to higher visual areas that the disk is behind the ring. Therefore, we designed this random dot stereogram for an erosion of this three-dimensional scene for the peripheral vision, which simply believes the feedforward reports from V1. Indeed, this predicted illusion was observed, but such a nonsense scene is not observed by central vision, which can veto it by top-down feedback. Another predicted illusion is the flip-tilt illusion. And it is analogous to this reverse depth illusion, but it's in the perception of a tilt or orientation. And it's like this. This is not a random door stereogram, and there's no stereo vision here. Anyway, here is a pair of two black dots aligned vertically. And here is another pair of dots. One dot is black, another dot is white, also aligned vertically. And these two dots are contrast reversed from each other like in this pair of corresponding dots in this stereogram. We predict that if you put these dot pairs in your peripheral visual field, then the black-black dot pair still appears as in a vertical alignment, and this black-white dot pair, however, should appear as if it's horizontally aligned. In other words, the orientation of their spatial alignment appears orthogonal to the actual alignment. This illusion indeed appears in peripheral vision, but not in central vision. In addition, we further test the V1 saliency hypothesis, which, as mentioned, involves predominantly peripheral vision. For example, Vish predicts that if one is searching for a black-black pair of dots among black-white pairs of dots, then it's faster and easier to find this target dot pair here. Yeah, when this target dot pair is parallel to the non-target dot pair compared to when it's perpendicular to the non-target dot pairs. And this prediction is opposite to the well-known wisdoms in visual search literature, but it is related to the flip tilt illusion above and is predicted if visual saliency is determined by V1 neural responses rather than by some abstract concepts of object orientation. And this saliency value then dictates the ease of visual search. So when it's higher uh, saliency value, then it's easier to search for the target. And this prediction is indeed confirmed by our data. Here we have predicted behavioral reaction times from neural substrates using VISH. One can also predict neural properties from behavioral data, and therefore a theory can also be a tool to investigate neural properties from non-invasive behavioral experiments. This is being carried out 
by ongoing projects in my lab. And this theory is precise enough such that some of the behavioral predictions can be very quantitative without free parameters. So the theory, if it's incorrect, can be more easily falsified by experiments. In central vision, we study how feedforward and feedback processes interact with each other. In one example, we use again random dot stereograms. We built a hybrid random dot stereogram such that in some dots, the corresponding dots have the same color, both white or both black. In some other dots, a black dot in one eye corresponds to a white dot in the other eye. To central vision, the color matched dots make sense, but the non-matched dots do not make sense. The feedforward and feedback loop gives dynamic outcomes. If the images are shown too briefly so that the feedback has no time to act, then the feedforward V1 signals will dictate perception. Both the matched and the non-matched dots will contribute to the perception of the depths of this central disk. If the images are shown for a longer time, the feedback process vetoes the non-matched dots. If these dots disagree with the color-matched dots by their respective V1 depth signals in terms of whether the disk is in front or behind the ring. However, if the matched dots and the non-matched dots agree with each other by their V1 depth signals, then the recognition process makes use of both type of dots to make their V1 signals reinforce each other, even though the non-matched dots are not perfect. As a result, the depth of the central disk, whether it's in front or behind, is seen more clearly. Therefore, the recognition process is nonlinear and constructive, and the feedback plays a big role in perception. This constructiveness is perhaps similar to the one that enables one to see a triangle here. Based on limited and ambiguous information from this image, our brain's internal model of the visual world fills in the details for us to see the full triangle. Another example is visual backward masking. And let me show you what it is. If this red rose is shown very briefly and then quickly disappears, it can be much briefer than this in real experiments, but let's say that it's not too brief so that you can just still recognize this rose. If, however, after this brief rose, you have an apple following very briefly, and now it's much harder to see the rose, yeah? And this is called masking, meaning that the apple has masked the rose. And this can be understood as follows. When the feedback is ready, to about to verify the rows, the apple signal is about to be fed forward. And then these two signals can't fit with each other, and so the feedback process vetoes the original rows. In addition from our framework, since the feedback is weaker in the peripheral visual field, this masking effect should be weaker there as well. Central vision and peripheral vision are not isolated from each other in typical visual behavior that combines eye movements and fixations in a dynamic manner with visual inputs arising from a whole visual field. We therefore investigate them using eye tracking and other methodologies. This is therefore an overview of my research plan for vision given the issues facing the vision research community. My hope is to enable fresh research progress by asking new scientific questions, linking neural substrates with behavior, and making hypotheses highly falsifiable. In our trilogy of approaches for our current focus, our progress so far is mainly to investigate our new framework at the computational and behavioral levels, in our next step, we would like to expand by motivating and carrying out studies at the level of neurons and circuits, while continue our computational and behavioral studies. 
the computational issues in vision, particularly feed forward and feedback between V1 and higher visual areas, may find their parallels in olfaction. Here we have the olfactory bulb receiving older inputs and higher olfactory centers and feed forward and feedback processes for olfactory object selection and recognition. We can, for example, explore common computational principles, principles across different senses. Thank you for your interests, and you can get more details from these websites.